Hi, can people hear me? The microphone's working? <coughs> Everyone can hear in the back? Okay, great. Um, I'm Frances Buell. I'm going to be the moderator and conversation traffic director, if I could use the word traffic here tonight. <laughs> having rocks thrown at me. Um, and um, like probably a lot of you, I read Jane Jacobs in my 20s, um, long before I ever thought I'd be a journalist or, or be covering City Hall. So. Um, it, this was great to see this film uh, about someone who had a pretty profound effect uh, on me all those years ago. Um, I, For those of you who don't know, just so you know a little bit of my background, I have covered urban issues and city politics in the city since 1994, first for the Vancouver Sun and the last decade <clears throat> for the Globe and Mail, primarily, but also some magazines. Um, however, I want to move on to our guests here. Um, who are going to uh, talk about the film, um, argue, probably argue about it a bit, uh, and also about Jane Jacobs' legacy. And we want to have time for comments and questions from the audience. I see a lot of people I know here. Um, I think this is a pretty knowledgeable crowd, um, so looking forward to hearing from you as well. Um, I appreciate that it's late. We're, we're half an hour behind um, schedule here. So um, we're all going to try and keep it succinct um, so that we can make as many points as possible and hear from as many people. So um, I asked everyone um, who's here, uh, first of all, to um, talk a bit about the film, what their impressions of it, what they thought it said about Jane Jacobs' le legacy, maybe what was missing. Um, and just to introduce our speakers, um, I'll do it all at once. Uh, starting over. On the far side is um, Yuri Artebis, who is currently the uh, executive director of the Vancouver City Planning Commission, a relatively new um, uh, position, um, uh, and uh, founder of the James Walk uh, in Vancouver in 2009, uh, also um, on the board of some um, housing groups in Vancouver. I know him primarily through social media, where I feel like he's often commenting on um, things in the city. Um, next to him is Elizabeth McKenzie, who is an architect um, and a professor at UBC, um, a former city planner, so don't hold that against her. She, <laughs> uh, she is no longer one. Um, and <laughs> uh, the initiator of Jane's Walk, uh, or the current um, coordinator of Jane's Walk in Vancouver. Um, and then next to me uh, is Brent Totteron, who uh, was the uh, director of planning for the city of Vancouver from 2006 to 2012, if I have that right. Um, uh, pr prior to that was a, direct, or was a, a planner in Calgary. Um, he had been a cult consultant before that. He continues now as a consultant both here in the city and internationally. Um, if you're on Twitter, you can't avoid him. Um, <laughs> no, no, you can't actually. People retweet you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so these are our three speakers for the night. They'll tell you a little bit more about their biographies, um, perhaps as they speak. Um, and so I'll start with you, Yuri, and then move uh, this way um, for your initial responses to the film uh, and to what it said about Jane's principles or what it didn't say. Hi. Um, just, just to clarify, I was actually, although I did, I found Jane's Walk in Phoenix, not in Vancouver, and then I moved up here and was director a couple of years here in Vancouver as well. So I've been seen it from both sides of, and I'd like to actually start with that. Actually, um, <coughs> when I was in Phoenix in 2009, well, I was in Phoenix for about four years, and I saw kind of what we saw there. What happened when they ran freeways through downtown and tore down what considered decrepit buildings and and uh, how hard it was to rebuild community after the buildings and are, the buildings are gone. Sure, you're making houses for new people, but the people who are leaving weren't the people who are coming. And one of the interesting things is when I moved, decided to move back to Canada and moved back to Vancouver, people from Phoenix are saying, well, what are you gonna do there? Everything is perfect here. We have, you know, everything's done. We're, we wanna be like you and, and uh, you know, the grass is always greener, of course, but I think on why Vancouver has done a lot, and we've 
we had our own fight against the freeways. Um, we've also learned the downsides of some of the you know lessons, and uh, we've also forgot a lot of the lessons of Jane Jacobs that talk today. I think the most important thing I got out of the film was the uh, there was a line she had. Uh, I think it was on a poster that said, um, "Consciousness is the ultimate weapon," and that to me is what Jane Jacobs is about. It's about her. She first and foremost, she was a uh, observationalist, she was a thinker, she was a writer. Um, you'll hear it in the movies and you read her books and she never wanted to be an activist that she felt thrust that was thrust upon her. She wanted to think and understand what was going around her and she more than important than that she wanted all of us and everyone in their neighborhood to think and understand and pro process what was going around her and why she was a successful activist is one because of that deep thought that she engaged in, but also because she truly believed in the community and friendships and those social bonds. To her, eyes on the street and the sidewalk ballet were more than just about public safety. They were about public understanding, about knowing your neighbors, about those loose connections that really make a place comfortable, and also a place that you can draw on when you need to rally thousands of people to oppose a freeway or, uh, you know. So those are kind of my thoughts, and I'll get a little more into them later, but I'll let others talk. Great. Hello. Hello. Um, well, as much as I do know about Jane Jacobs, uh, I still felt the movie was really thrilling to see that uh, David and Goliath, to see um, what we all dream about in action and so successful. And yet I'm also puzzled by Moses, who, well, great name by the way, who, um, you know, he seemed to start out like a good guy with the idea of parks and and, and I guess it just was the power that got to him and uh, brought him over the top. Um, first of all, thank you to uh, Vif for organizing this uh, very interesting opportunity to have this conversation. I, I just want to add one thing to the introduction to give a little bit of balance, perhaps, to my past. I, I'm also the president, the one of the founders and president of the of an advocacy organization on better urbanism called the Council for Canadian Urbanism. You can find us on Twitter or on our website. And I've always considered that, to, and I've been in that role for nine years, including while I was chief planner here. I've always considered it an opportunity for me to remember the other side, the activism, because I am an activist in that context, uh, advocating for better cities uh, and better urbanism and better city making in Canada. The other observation I have to start is I find it ironic that they've set it up uh, this way where sort of three theoretical experts are being interviewed by the one of us that is most analogous to Jane Jacobs <laughs> in the context of being a writer uh, uh, who writes about cities and observes them all the time. I, I can't help but find that ironic. Um, in my context, uh, first of all, because this is a film festival, I have to say that my first observation is I find the, the film a visi visually beautiful, visually striking film. I'm always amazed at, the, at how beautiful and striking and eerily beautiful or ironically ugly and beautiful at the same time cities can be. I am, fa I am obsessed and fascinated by cities. I always have been. I always will be. Uh, when I was thinking uh, watching the film, I was thinking about who the audience was supposed to be. Is it supposed to tell city planners and those of us professionally involved in city making more about Jane Jacobs that we haven't already probably already read? I've read myself three or four books not by Jane Jacobs but on Jane Jacobs. There are a lot of books of, and, and about Jane Jacobs as a person and her struggles with Moses, for, for example. I'm presuming it's supposed to be for citizens. And I'm really interested, and I'm not sure we're going to get a chance or not, but really interested to hear from citizens who aren't professionally involved in the city-making functions whether this is interesting, first of all, or is it boring? Uh, because I think we make city-making, which is an inherently interesting thing, I think we make it mind-numbingly boring most of the time. So is this an inherently more interesting way to communicate some of the messages about better city-making, etc.? Uh, or is it more for a prof professional audience? One of the things I liked about it is it didn't just uh, tell us about Jane versus Moses. There was the third antagonist, who is Le Corbusier, who does not get enough uh, conversation and attention. Because Moses was the doer. 
he was influenced by Le Corbusier, and it was Le Corbusier who was the evil visionary behind a lot of the worst I evils of modernist city planning and city making. Uh, and notwithstanding what some of the architects tried to do to apologize for him that he was misinterpreted, no, I've read his source material. It's awful from the perspective of his ideas about cities and the streets, etc. So yes, they changed some things, but the source material was equally bad. Uh, as was uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's when he talked about cities, etc. A lot of these original ideas were from architects who tried to translate their ideas about buildings into the city because that's what they knew and they just extrapolated. Uh, so I'm glad uh, the film spent a fair amount of time actually talking about Le Corbusier, that source material. And it's important because he's coming back around again. I'm starting to notice young architects starting to talk about him in favorable terms. Uh, uh, wasn't he cool and avant-garde, uh, like Rourke in, in uh, Fountainhead? Uh, and there's the, there's, the, um, there's the growth of what's called the master planners. Have you heard this term? It's a play on words of the architect. But now the architects have realized there's good money in city planning, too, uh, and master planning of whole new communities. So, Zaha Hadid and Daniel Liebskin have designed, have started to design cities and speak for urbanism again. And I, I'm scared to death of that because it's, to me, it's going back to the past again and the same risks associated with the damage that Le Corbusier did and, uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright did to the city planning profession. I say that because I graduated in the early 1990s from city and regional planning and immediately went out into a profession that had an inferiority complex because we'd been bashed by Jane Jacobs for 20 years as being evil. And I was one of the first generations that was, as city planners, that was trying to define what a new city planning profession was that was built on Jane instead of built on Le Corbusier. And yet I was almost embarrassed to call myself a city planner at the time. I'm not anymore. I'm proud to call myself a city planner. But I am incredibly often uh, critical still of the city planning profession and the traffic engineering profession and the architectural profession when they do things that are profoundly bad for cities. So I, I'll stop there, but, but I just want to say I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this from the perspective of the conversations I'm trying to start around cities, around the world, and I'm trying to figure out if this is going to help me or not. Uh, in getting the message out, not to the people already involved in city making, but to the general public, because that's, and, and by extension, the politicians who are still making the decisions, not city planners, uh, and whether it's going to help us make better decisions. Uh, okay, thanks um, for the first round. And um, uh, my uh, observation at the end of it, uh, there was one speaker, I, I can't remember who the name was, but um, he said towards the end, our goal has to be to manage change well, not to freeze it in time, which I thought was great, a great message going forward. And okay. one, uh, and, but it wasn't one that the film answered, um, because mostly what we saw was Jane Jacobs resisting the freeway, the eradication of neighborhoods, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the bulldozing of a park. So we saw her fighting to preserve the old, we didn't see very much about what she advocated for in terms of acceptable change. And I think we were talking about that a little bit before. So I know I said I was going to ask you a different question. I'll get to that. That's the second one. But I, I, those of you who are knowledgeable about um, you know, what Jane Jacobs wrote, it, in terms of managing change and advocating for new things in cities, what do you think was missing from that film that could have been done, uh, you know, in terms of that? Yeah, that was a, a good observation, and we did talk about it before. And she, this wasn't the biggest part of her life, although it was the most important legacy she left. But she didn't spend that much time. Yuri was talking about that earlier. This was a, just a small portion of her life. And she kept going on with the uh, freeways for a while. And then she got involved in economics more. So um, we don't know what she would have done. We, we know where she lived. We know where she chose to live. But they were of the same caliber. And 
I like to think of what she would have done. I like to think some of the places in Chinatown with just one single building that's built in a bit higher and, and modern would be the sort of thing oh, she would like as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing that Jane Jacobs gets kind of a bad rap for these days is that she was the anti-planning, per se, or anti-planner. And I think um, her complaint wasn't that planning isn't important. And indeed, she later on did a lot of planning work with, in Toronto with various administrations there. But that planners weren't paying attention to how the cities actually worked. Uh, we saw it in this that, you know, Robert Moses and Carbu and people came down and said, I don't really care what people want, this is what needs to be done, and this is because our models say this is works, it will work. So I think she, uh, rather than anti-planning, she was really arguing for empirical planning rather than pr principle planning, which, and by which case, I mean, kind of paying attention to how cities work and following up to see what what our interventions do do and so kind of much more of an incremental model um i think one of my friends i forget where i heard this but someone called you know we have all these different types of urbanisms these days but one of the ones you said that may fit for jane jake was would be the doctrine of incomplete urbanism jane did believe that cities were never finished and we need to leave space for others and future generations to iterate on top of the work we do today we don't know who's going to, we don't know how we're going to be living in 20 years, let alone who's going to be living with us. So, you know, when we plan for the future, planning for the future is not planning each and every building and window and door size and storefront. Um, it's realizing the future isn't settled and leaving room in our plans and our ideas in our discussions for the unexpected and the, and what comes next. Okay, great. And Grant, I think you had have had some experiences with Jane visiting Vancouver and taking a look at some of the new things that were built and her response to that. Not me, uh, but Larry Beasley uh, uh, has certainly told me stories about, and, and I see Nathan Ellison, there's probably members of, of, of planning staff that were around, and I've certainly heard stories of Jane being, at least in Larry's uh, recollection to me, relatively complimentary of what Vancouver has managed to do from an urbanism perspective. It's been said, I've said it, and when I've said it, I've been repeating Larry who said it, that no one individual has had more of an effect on the Vancouver model of city make making than Jane Jacobs, as uh, no one individual. And I can see, and you know, some might, might uh, laugh at that and say, well, but we do tall glass buildings and such. But if you actually look at the, the principles and the things that we focus on and care about in the city making process, ranging from um, um, uh, um, content details like focusing on the street to process details like uh, in our best moments doing public engagement well and in our worst moments not so well. Uh, but certainly caring about public engagement more than other cities that I've seen across Canada and certainly across the world. There's a lot to be seen about um, uh, uh, Jane's principles and ideas landing in what eventually became Vancouverism or the Vancouver model or whatever you want to call it that. But, uh, so I think she's had a lot of influence. I've heard she's more complimentary than not uh, of Vancouver. And that is rare because to, to your point, she, I think she made a practice of not commenting much on particularly new change and new developments. It was more about protecting uh, what we said. We knew what she wanted to protect. We didn't necessarily know what would, be, what would reasonably de be defined as a successful new development. But I think I'd like to be able to extrapolate that when you focus on eyes on the street, when you build in a human scale, even with tall towers with a podium that creates a human scale, when you do a lot of different things that, that introduce the elements of her messaging, the toughest one being new uses for old buildings, because we, we, we haven't saved that many old buildings. Um, you can see a lot of her messages. But the, to me, the most interesting element of Jane's um, legacy here right now is, is the fact that there's sort of two parts to Jane's legacy. One is the content piece, density, mixed use, focus on the street, etc. And that's all um, uh, influenced our urbanism uh, significantly. The other is the activist piece, which is almost neutral to the content. And it's a, it's a, we've got a very strong tradition of Jane Jacobs-like activism here in Vancouver. 
It's ironic that occasionally I find that activism dedicated to positions that I don't believe Jane Jacobs would support. You know, you can have activism that, su that uh, supports, or that opposes bike lanes. You can have activism that support, uh, supports uh, adding different kinds of uh, housing to a single family, single detached neighborhood. Ironically, one of the only two conversations I ever had with Jane uh, while she was alive, the more substantive conversation w was about the evils of single-use zoning. And particularly the example being discussed was single detached housing zoning. And yet, her own uh, legacy of activism is often used to uh, resist change in the single detached neighborhoods, which I've always found, found ironic. But it sort of shows that there's two aspects to Jane's legacy. One is the content about how to understand and appreciate how cities work, particularly dense cities work. Because we haven't talked a lot about the suburbs in that film or in this conversation. But the other part is the how you fight City Hall, how you, or how you instill change within City Hall, which is something I've always tried to do. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. We'll have one more round, and then I'll open it up um, to the audience. And we don't really have a microphone for the audience, so you'll have to yell a bit, and then I'll... I'll, uh, I'll uh, if I think that other people can't hear, I'll repeat the question. But to get to the question that we had talked about before, um, how much influence do you think Jacobs has had? This is something that Brent brought up that he thought we should discuss. How much influence has she really had? And I, I tend to have an outsized idea of her influence because every planner I've ever talked to in my 20 four years or 23 years of covering the city keeps talking about her and keeps talking about her ideas. So I tend to think like, oh, the whole world has been shaped by Jane Jacobs, but in fact, uh, it hasn't. So um, how much influence has she really had? Um, I think you're right that every planner and every wannabe planner and every community activist um, knows Jane and talks about Jane. I also think though she, I mean, you hear in some circles called um, Saint Jane and what would Jane Jacobs do? Um, and I think that's kind of her strength and her weakness because everyone, just like a saint, just like a religion in some regards, everyone has their own interpretations of it. And as Brent pointed out, she can be used to oppose and defend the same argument. Um, so, I think it's great that she got people thinking about cities and thinking about networks and thinking about, I think her most important legacy was really that cities are organic and uh, ecosystems and they're not, they weren't the kind of clear cut reforestation systems that we've been imposing. So I think that is probably her greatest strength, but it's interesting because anyone you talk to, regardless of what side of the argument on, would cite Jane Jacobs in their defense. I'd say her uh, influence has been cyclical in that when she became most famous in the 70s, um, that was also an era, you know, the era after the hippies and um, the energy scares and back to the landers that then subsided, say, in the 80s and 90s. And now we're back there, and it seems to me almost like the city of Vancouver is just divided in half, where half the people are so happy to live in high rises and squished into the uh, West End and in Yale Town and can't believe their good fortune to bring their children up in these dense areas with parks and shops and everything. And half are the other way. They want their individual houses. And I thought one thing was really great with this city, and it's sort of against activism, all the activism against laneway houses and suites in uh, people's houses and when I was at the city it was a while ago and it, it was 75% single family homes in Vancouver and that's changed but you know this is a very sleepy town compared to most which have a lot more uh, dense housing to start with um, but that every now and then at the city someone would just say you know despite all the opposition they'd say okay we're having um, laneway houses Everyone's allowed. Okay, we're having secondary suites. Okay, we're doing that. You know, so in fact, these single-family houses in Vancouver have been quite dense, and they're denser by square footage than even the duplex zones. So it's against uh, what people necessarily wanted, but it's been accommodated, I think, uh, very graciously within the city. One of the things I 
used to say or think you know, in my 20s was, Jane Jacobs is what all planners read, but not what all planners did. And there was a disconnect between what planners, I, I think, either said they wanted to do or really did want to do but couldn't do. And I had, and some of that, sometimes for good or sometimes for ill. But we do certainly have the ability more to to uh, drive the urbanist agenda. Uh, what I observed to to Francis was that you cannot assume Jane Jacobs has had influence because you live in this bubble of Vancouver. Because for every city where we successfully stop the freeways, there are five that built them and are still building them. I'm working around the world where they are still building freeways. Around this region, we are still building freeways. I think we're, we have cities of Jane Jacobs run by a province of Robert Moses that still <laughs> wants to build big freeways. Right. So, uh, and the truth is, we, Jane, I think, won the battle of urban renewal. And not just Jane, it sounds like she was, the urban thinkers won the battle of urban renewal, but did not win the battle of the freeways. The freeways battle continued and is still continuing today. And I still think Robert Moses may have more influence globally in most of the cities uh, and uh, on, when it comes to freeways. And the Vancouver's of the world are still the outliers, although a lot of us are out there working around the world trying to change that. Okay, great. Um, I'd love to hear from people in the audience.